I'm here introducing John Charples from the Australian Bureau, Bureau of Meteorology. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about the work he's done for his visit here, um, helping the Met Plus team with um, improving our testing infrastructure. Um, and he'll also talk a little bit about um, how the Bureau's using Met Plus in their verification system. So take it away, John. Thanks, George. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm John Sharples. I'm a software developer at the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and today I'm giving you great value. It's a two for one talk. I'm doing two topics. You're going to squeeze it into the one time slot. So great value for money. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, talking about a project we've got running at the Bureau of Meteorology to adopt MetPlus as our operational verification system. Uh, and I'd just like to highlight that although I'm here talking, um, this is the work of lots of people at the Bureau. So uh, a lot of my colleagues' names just listed up there. Uh, before we get started, I thought I might just give a bit of context about the Bureau for those that don't know. Uh, this is the organisational structure. We're divided into six separate groups around the CEO in the middle. Uh, Bureau has an operating budget of around $450 million. And that's, that's dollar bucks, not American dollars. So you times that by 0.7 to get you know, what it is for, for, the, for US dollars. Um, unlike here, we do both the operational and the research side of things. So there's no NCAR no uh, kind of split, we're all under the one umbrella, it's just the Bureau. Um, so across the top there, business solutions and community services, uh, they are kind of the operational side of things, they deal a lot with external customers, um, they do the actual forecast, uh, and one of the good things about the Bureau is they generate around about $100 million of, of revenue themselves, which goes into the operating budget. We also have, you know, a very large IT section, enterprise services, and then I sit down the bottom in that uh, little box there that says science and innovation, and I'm in the research to operations group. And my talk today is gonna to be very much about the two operations part of research to operations. So apologies to everyone who's tuned in for a science talk, this is gonna be very much a software engineering talk. Just a little bit of further context um, for what I'm gonna talk about today. Don't worry too much about reading all the words here. Uh, the main takeaway for this slide is that we are currently undergoing a, pro a big project called Robust. Uh, and the key takeaway there is that line in bold, that we have a comprehensive redesign of every IT system in the Bureau. So that's from the laptop through to the supercomputer is all being completely over, um, redesigned and uplifted. Uh, and this is a really big transformation that really kind of sets, uh, sets a lot of the tone for what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so where does, where does MetPlus fit in at the Bureau? So in 2021, um, this, we released this report at the Bureau, the Forecast Quality Roadmap, which is authored by Beth Ebert, that some of you might know. Uh, and it kind of spelled out a pathway to really improve our forecast quality. Uh, and unsurprisingly, verification was a cornerstone in that. And this report really recommended that we adopt uh, MetPlus to deliver a lot of that verification. So this led to the creation of a project, which I am attached to, which was to deliver MetPlus uh, as an operational verification system within the Bureau. All right, again, a conceptual slide. Don't worry too much about the details here, but this should just give you a gist of what we're, we're trying to achieve. So on the uh, left-hand side there in the current state, um, this is kind of describing where we were when that report was written. We had this system called Jive. So Jive's our point-based verification system. It's a much beloved and much used uh, verification tool within the Bureau, uh, but it only does the point-based verification at, um, at uh, weather, weather station sites. And then for all, all of our other verification, we have this huge big hodgepodge, uh, various bits of software running different technologies, most of it running in development systems. Um, and in a, in a classic kind of government style, it was developed by someone who then left and no one knew how it worked or how to, how to maintain it, how to extend it. So we had really limited capacity to um, A, do new verification, so add anything new into these systems, um, and then B, do anything in kind of an operational sense, because a lot of this stuff was not really fit for an operational setting. Uh, and not really running on technologies but supported wires around the Bureau. So the concept of, of this whole project is to move from that kind of messy thing on the left over to this beautiful thing on the right, where we've got this lovely golden box that's got MetPlus inside it, um, that's gonna deliver all of our gridded verification needs. Um, and ideally that would be you know, complementary to what already happens in Jive, uh, produce verification results that would then be displayed in a consistent um, way. Okay, so how are we gonna achieve this? How are we gonna move from that kind of like hodgepodge of doing lots of different things into like a really nice uh, streamlined way um, that's gonna be consistent across all of our verification. So we came up with this workflow where we really we've got our, our verification scientists there on the left, 
Um, they are going to develop bits of verification in some kind of development system, uh, which would then be promoted to our production system and then would be consumed by all of the lovely people at the Bureau, the forecasters, the scientists, uh, and anyone else that needs verification data. But in coming up with this workflow, we had two things that we really wanted to get get right to you know, not repeat the mistakes of the past, as it were. Um, the first was our development system and our production system should be as as identical as possible, as close as possible, so that when we go from, okay, we, we're happy with this bit of verification, let's make the production product, that that transitions very, very quickly, very, very smooth. Uh, and the other one is that when our scientists are developing new bits of verification, they're you know, configuring grid stat or ensemble stat, um, they can get very quick feedback about whether that's producing the results they want. So how do we go about designing a system? And this is a, a busy slide, so I'll linger on it for a while and give you plenty of time to, to just digest it. Uh, so we've come up with a, a system that kind of wraps around MET+. Um, the typical kind of workflow is we've got our input data at the top, so that's NWP data. Uh, it's the official forecast out of GFE. And I believe Noah has a GFE as well, so everyone knows what I mean when I say GFE. It's, it's the, basically the, the tool that they use to edit the grids and create a final forecast, which then goes out. Um, and they've got observation data. This goes through a data processing layer. I'm not really going to talk about that in detail unless anyone's got specific questions about it. But basically what that's doing is making sure that the, the data in the native format that the Bureau produces it is then something that MetPlus can read. Um, and I think talking to other organisations that have used MetPlus, that's a, that, that, you know, a reasonably big step to kind of say, make sure Met, MetPlus is, make sure the data is in a format that MetPlus can then ingest. Uh, and then kind of the major innovation we've, we've kind of added is on the right-hand side over here, where we've got our MetPlus configuration files um, stored in source control. So this little fox icon here is for GitLab. We don't use GitHub, we use GitLab. So sorry about the, if that's a bit incomprehensible. But yeah, so we store the MetPlus configs in source control. And then we have this config parser and task generator. And what that's actually doing, it, it reads the MetPlus config files. It works out what times it has to run for. It works out what files it's needing to run that job. And then it goes and tells, it, it chews up a job that says, hey, when this file turns up, run this MetPlus command. So rather than just triggering the MetPlus commands to run at a set time, we're actually waiting for the files to arrive. Uh, we're, sorry, we're parsing the MetPlus config file itself, working out what it needs. They're waiting for those files to arrive and then running it. And then over all of this, we've got um, this tool called Airflow, which is kind of used as a master scheduler. And it can do, you know, it can be configured to do any of these things. It can be configured to fetch the data, to trigger the data processing, um, to pull the, pull the uh, MetPlus config files out of source control, uh, and then to trigger the MetPlus jobs themselves. And we've done our best to make this kind of as automated as possible. So the idea here is, remember that little loop of saying that when the scientists put their config files into source control, as quickly as possible, they're gonna be seeing a MetPlus job running and start seeing their outputs. So I'm going to just try and do something a bit fancy here and um, show you what this looks like uh, in real life. So sorry about the resolution here. I'll just see if I can fit this on the screen. Um, so this here is, is Airflow. This is what it looks like. Uh, I'm just running here locally. Uh, and on the rows across the screen, you can see different jobs. And I've got some jobs called things like clean up data and fetch GPM data. Those are turned off because I'm not actually connected to any networks here. Um, <clears throat> but you notice there's a job here called uh, auto generated MET plus job access G 12 Z precip GPM. And if I click on that, it should take me to some detailed views. It hasn't fallen asleep. Uh, and here I'll get a, a detailed view of what this job is actually doing. So you'll see the main thing is over on the left-hand side, you'll see one task here that says wait for access G data so that's that, that, you know, finding out what files it needs and then waiting for them. And then one that says run that plus analysis. And then as these jobs tick along, you can see here you get little green squares. I think that one's uh, running. This one will say it's failed and then there might be others that are queued up. Um, but one of the things we've added to this is to say that, you know, this is a really nice interface. This just comes straight out of Airflow. It's a good way to track what verification you've got going on at the moment. But on the back end, all of these jobs are basically just driven by um, standard MetPlus config files. So this is just a config file to run PCP combine and grid stat. Uh, it's got all of the standard stuff that you would expect in there. 
But just suppose that I was to say, oh, hang on a minute, I've, I've got a, just one lead time here, I didn't want that, I'll comment that out, and I want all these other lead times. Um, and I'll save that file. And yeah, so this is just a standard MET plus uh, config, but we have a small other config file that kind of tells Airflow, this is just what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items, and it's just sort of some extra config files that tell Airflow how to read that, con read the MET plus config file and generate a job. And if I click back here, uh, I might have to refresh it. Oh, there you go. Um, so you see that even though I've just updated the config file, Airflow's read that straight away and turned it into a job. It's queued it here. So the intention here is that when our scientists are developing new verification, they don't have to go, hey, developer, I've made this change. Can you make sure it works? And we go maybe make a change and get it reviewed and get it merged. Um, that they can really just sit here with this system, refresh it, uh, get their things running as they expect. Um, and the other good thing is because of this system, which is the development system, is almost identical to the production system, um, hopefully the, the promotion from development to production is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, so in in this instance, I've just got it. I'm I'm saving it to a file, and Airflow's scanning that file every ten seconds or something. So it's um, so in 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 this uh, example, I've just kind of jury rigged it to make hey check every ten seconds to make sure it's working. In the production system, it'll be uh, push from the source control. So when you commit your new config file into GitLab, we'll have a uh, CI run that'll you know parse it. Say this looks like you haven't got any issues in here. Looks like I don't understand what's in this config file. Push it up and you know refresh the server. So it'll be linked to the to the, the cache. Yeah, yeah. So it could be either you could have ones that, that operate on branches. Um, so a development one would operate on the development branch, and we would have a production one being driven from the production. Are there any other questions before I flick back? Uh, we're it's fairly in the GitLab um, pipelines. So, so what, I guess, since we, you know, we were using GitLab, how does the GitLab pipeline, or PI, how does it differ? Uh, um, that's probably too big of a question. If, uh, yeah, I, I guess, because I've only really been exposed to the GitHub actions through this project here, I, I wouldn't say I, I'm really familiar with the differences, but very similar functionality. You're basically spinning up some container, you're running some code inside it, and then executing some actions based on that. Uh, in, internally inside the bureau, we have our own instance of it, yeah. All right, I'll just try and get the slides back. Uh, so yeah, and yet yeah, here's a, just a screenshot to show what it looks like when you've actually got data in there and you've actually got things running, you get these nice little green dots that say, hey, everything's good. Um, yeah, so in terms of what, what verification are we actually doing? So in the first, kind of first stage, uh, when we went around the bureau and asked people what they wanted verified, everyone said rainfall, rainfall is the number one thing. And also the one thing that they were particularly interested in um, on, uh, for MetPlus is some of those spatial verification tools that they have available. Uh, so yeah, really looking to replace those NWP verification tools that were already running in you know kind of a hodgepodge of different ways. Um, implement some new spatial verification capacity, especially for rainfall and, and also for the probability of precipitation. Uh, and then, yeah, get the, some gritted verification of the official forecast to go out. Um, again, Access G is our global model. Access C is our regional city model, high resolution. And Improver there is the uh, statistical post-processing product, very similar to the Met Office's Improver. Um, so this is very much a project that's in flight. We, we're not finished by any means. Uh, still to come, we've obviously got to do a lot more verification, a lot more um, <coughs> combinations of, you know, slicing things up by the areas, the lead times, the initialization times, looking at different models. Uh, got to work through all those um, combinations of things that we want tested. When we went all the way around the Bureau and asked everyone what they wanted verified, you come back with a list that's I think there were you know, several hundred things that people wanted. So there's a bit of a prioritization exercise as well. Uh, one thing I didn't manage is all of our software has to be distributed by Conda builds. 
So that robust project I mentioned right at the top, one of the outcomes of that is that yeah, everything we do is basically distributed by Conda. That includes the actual application that I showed you today will be packaged up as a Conda application and deployed. I guess so as a wish list, if somehow MET and MET Plus were started being published as, as Conda packages, that would be great. And I know there's existing issues um, already in GitHub for this, but uh, that would be a lovely thing for us. Um, a big question that we still have is around uh, how we're going to visualize our outputs. Um, so the project as it stands is really just about producing MET Plus results. Um, and we haven't really come to a decision about how we're going to aggregate all that and serve it out to people in, in ways they want. Or at least we hadn't made that decision five weeks ago and left Australia, and I don't think so yet. But uh, So some of the issues that we have to, to kind of get our heads around are data storage, uh, how are we going to collect all, all of the outputs and, and aggregate them. I know we've got Met Data IO uh, available to us as, as a tool to use. Uh, again, mentioning that robust project, they weren't particularly happy on us using MySQL for some reason, um, but that's a, a discussion that we can, you know, we'll be having with them ongoing. We also have an existing application, which I mentioned before, Jive, which is, as I said, much beloved and much used. And as far as our users are concerned, they don't want to have to go to one place to get their verification for the points and then some other place to get their verification for the grids. So certainly from a user perspective, they would like those things to be integrated. And if we can somehow get the Met Plus uh, outputs being displayed in Jive, I think that would probably be a, a really great solution for certainly for the people who are using the verification. Um, but being a software developer, I don't want to write any new code that exists already. Um, so I was in favor of adopting tools that already exist. Uh, and one of the discussions we have been having is, you know, we've got the Met Plus analysis tools, but we've also got Verpi, which is the Met Office's verification package, which is already being used um, by various people in the research um, at the Bureau. Uh, and it has capacity to read Met outputs and, and plot them as well. And I know some people have been playing around with doing that. So it's a bit of a watch this space in terms of visualization. Um, but I think, you know, my, my feeling is that it'll be some combination of uh, using the tools that are already available and possibly just visualizing them in Jive. And that's the first part of my talk done. Are there any questions about any of that? Nothing online yet? I am happy to take questions or criticisms or encouragements. So do, yeah, don't be shy. Thank you very much for your presentation. So how can we update the verification process itself, like introducing a new variable or new observations? Yeah, OK, great question. So what I've described is really just a wrapper uh, around MET+, Plus, which is itself a wrapper around MET. Um, so in terms of getting new uh, metrics in there, you would have to talk to the, the engineers in the room here um, uh, that work on MET and MET+, Plus to get those new um, those new metrics in there. In terms of, I'll just flick back to the slide. In terms of new data sets, uh, the only real um, thing that's holding us back is this data processing layer. So depending on what the data set is, so if you want a, a new NWP output, uh, so the Bureau's, uh, the Bureau's model output comes out in GRIB format, and GRIB is just straight into MET+. Plus. It just, it, there's no pre-processing required. All you have to do is say, I want access G, um, you know, uh, whatever it is, temperatures at 850, uh, and it's it's a kind of plug and play. If you've got some kind of more complicated observation data set, or it's on a weird grid, uh, you'd probably have to talk to one of the developers to, to make sure that when that data comes in, it, it's being processed in a way that then Met Plus can ingest it and read it. So yeah, there is still a, a, an involvement with developers in terms of onboarding new data sets, um, but that's also you know that's once that's in, you can use it to do any kind of verification you like. Yeah, John. So I think in the example you showed us, it was a, a Met config file. Yep. Um, not the Met Plus, like count file, or was I? Did I catch that wrong? It was Met Plus. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Sorry, I've been too long of a day. All right. Thank you. <laughs> no, no worries. I've got a quick question. Yeah, Could you go to. forward to the um, slide that had the boxes of success and failure? Yeah. Um, 
So there, there's jobs that find the data and then the jobs that run the MetPlus analysis yep. uh, for each lead. Is that is it one MetPlus job and that's sort of telling you if it found the output of that or is it, does it somehow Yeah, so it? another good question and then you picked up on, on a bit of a subtlety here. Um, because of that configuration about you should want to run for different lead times, it, it, it can just handle that. Uh, it actually splits them out and runs them as separate jobs. So if you get lead time, um, so what have we got here? 24, 48, 72. If all three sets of files arrive at the same time, you get three separate jobs, one running for each lead time, rather than run loop over the lead times. So it parses the met plus config and then it has another met plus config that it uses to run, or you override the... Uh, it just leads. overrides them on the command okay. line. Right. So it'll, it'll, it'll parse it and then just say, um, I forget what the command is off the top of my head, but you know, dash C, yeah. uh, dash config, lead time equals yeah. something. Um, and just do it, do, yeah, command line overrides. So you have a lot of configurations of met plus, presumably. And um, NOAA uh, has a lot of configurations of MetPlus in their system called EVS for EMC verification system. And in the MetPlus repository, we have a lot of use cases. Yep. And whenever we submit a pull request, the use cases are run and we do regression testing to make sure we don't break anything. Do you think that, um, oh, Alicia's online there. Um, do you think that we should figure out how we can support our operational partners to do similar sorts of regression testing to make sure that when we're doing w with you with the bureau's use cases and NOAA's use cases, so we can figure out when we're doing new development, we don't break your stuff. Or what do you, what are your concerns in that area? <laughs> I mean, I, I have great faith in your use cases, so I don't have any concerns. Of course, um, I, so what you're describing is is yeah, a common problem in how do I adopt any kind of new version of software and make sure that it doesn't break stuff. Um, so the Bureau has a pretty strong culture of software testing. So I think the first step would be that we would slice this off into a feature branch with the new um, versions of Met and MetPlus in it. We would run all of our tests. We would try and run whatever use cases we have to make sure it works. Um, I, I want, I, I'm guessing maybe in your question you're saying is there some capacity to, to give that back to you so that you could also have our use cases and run them yourselves at the same time? Um. Yeah, I think, well, I guess it's unrealistic for us to, to test the union of all possible use cases yep. for every possible pro request. Um, so what should we do? Um, I'm, I'm thinking like in the release notes, when we have a new release, perhaps we should, we should really highlight in a very structured way the changes um, that or the, the modifications to the code included in that release that will change the results. So for example, there's a bug in the computation of some, yep. st some statistic. We make that crystal clear to you so that when you do that parallel testing and you see diffs, you can go and say, are these diffs expected based on a bug fix, for yep. example? Or do you have any thoughts about other things we can do to facilitate uh, your adoption of newer versions of the software? I, I um, I'd have to think about it a bit more, but certainly all of the all of the your standard operating things you want to do release notes obviously are, are excellent because that gives us um, a quick reference to everything that um, has changed and that we might want to look for changes in our own stuff. Uh, again, I you know getting onto the second part of the talk, making sure you've got good test coverage is is a great thing that gives us confidence to say that well when something changes we kind of know what it's going to be. Um, I think also, you know, we would expect to take on a certain amount of testing ourselves to make sure that before we but before we adopt the new version, it's everything's working as expected as well. So, yeah, I'm not not super worried about that aspect of things. Why well, is the question online? Um, can everyone on, can everyone online read that as well? Should I read it out? I'll assume people can see this, the question from uh, Alicia. Uh, so, do you run this package on the same machine where your weather models are? Um, no, no. So a, a, a large part of the design of this is because we have explicitly been told that this will run away from our supercomputer. So if we were running in the, in the same environment as, uh, as the models, we might simplify things a bit by just being able to watch and see when the file turns up and, and run. Um, 
but uh, yeah, a lot of the design in, in the system I've just demonstrated is because we are outside of the domain of where the models are generated. We have to wait till data gets shipped out to us. Uh, and because of that, can introduce delays, um, things might come in at unexpected times. Uh, because of that, we've, we've adopted this kind of like, we'll wait and watch approach where we wait for the files to turn up before we trigger anything. Do you use, um, for this, fi watching for files um, and triggering jobs, do you use like a, a, a widely used um, uh, workflow management system for that, like or EC Flow or Silk or something it's like that? It's all Airflow. It's Airflow, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is Airflow, um, I've never heard of it. Um, so is it being used elsewhere or is yes. it? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty okay. wide. It's, it's an Apache product. Okay. Um, being used fairly widely, possibly not in the scientific context. So every everything that runs on the supercomputer at the Bureau still uses Silk. So Silk is still yeah. pretty widely adapted. And the number one question we get is, why are you using this thing? Um, so it, it's in, compared to Silk, it's a very, very highly featured thing. And, you know, you get this lovely GUI that kind of just comes straight out of the box. Uh, it's got lots of... So, so the, the file watching is just a feature. It's a plugin that you get with Airflow that says, oh, um, you know, this particular bit of logic needs a, a file watcher. Watch this file. Um, and hang on a minute. Let's see if I can just show you. We can flick back here. Um, under the hood, if I look at the code here, hopefully this is big enough for you to see, uh, it's all just Python under the hood as well. Um, so you, you, you set these things up, uh, and here you can kind of see some of the logic for job in net plus configs, um, and you just, this DAG is the dynamic acyclical graph. Don't, you don't have to worry about what it means, because um, I barely know myself. Um, but that just triggers off the job, and you know, under here you'll have uh, a bunch of subtasks if I go down far enough, I will see one that says something like, um, you know, file wait task. So this is just defining what we're waiting for. And then after that, there'll be one that says, uh, you know, um, run Metplus analysis. And this is just invoking some bash operator to run Metplus. We were having discussions in the in RAL, in our lab, about um, the variety of automation systems that are being used and Airflow wasn't in the mix, so that's interesting. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's not widely adopted at the Bureau yet, but it is, again, getting back to that project I talked about, Robust, it's an approved bit of software, so I'm you know, expecting it to be more and more widely used. Okay, thanks everyone for your questions, that's great. Um, now getting on to the really, really exciting stuff, software testing. I know this is everyone's favorite topic, and you're going to be really excited to hear me talk about it. Um, so this, this part of the talk is really about what I'm doing here in Boulder. Uh, NCAR didn't fly me over here just to show off what we're doing back home. Um, I'm actually here as part of the DTC visitor program, uh, and this is a project that um, I did uh, as part of that project. So I, I wanted to start off by just saying uh, thanks to everyone involved in the visitor program. Uh, from the admin staff to uh, the NetPlus team that we're working with um, to the program coordinators. Uh, it's been a really great experience for me and I've really enjoyed my time here and it's been a really well-run well program uh, and they've been very generous with um, getting me over here and in making my visit really comfortable. So thank you everyone involved. Uh, so yeah, I've been working on a, a project to improve software testing in the NetPlus analysis tool and I'll just talk about this briefly, and I know it's going to be very, very exciting. Um, so to give you a bit of context, uh, as I mentioned in the last talk, Bureau is adopting MetPlus as an operational verification platform. Again, that robust project, one of the kind of guidelines that was handed down to us was that for any kind of new software we run, we want to make sure that it's really well tested. And they said, before we're going to adopt MetPlus, we want it to have a 90% uh, unit test coverage. Um, so that basically led to, you know, the Bureau deciding that we would donate a bit of, um, donate an in-kind contribution of developer time, that's my time, uh, to work on MetPlus unit test and trying to achieve that goal of 90%. Uh, so yeah, late last year, I spent uh, a bit of time working on that. And here's just a screen grab. If you run MetPlus in GitHub Actions now, you'll see that we've got 91% test coverage, so that's really good. 
Uh, but following on from that work, I actually applied for the DTC visitor program. Uh, I proposed this project called Improving MetPlus Test Infrastructure and Code Quality. Uh, and I had two kind of broad suggestions there, which was continuing to improve the unit test in MetPlus Analysis Suite and automated code quality. And then a discussion with some of the, some of the project staff, we decided to focus on this, this first uh, proposal in the, in the project. Uh, and yeah, my visit commenced on the 3rd of September this year. It's coming up for five weeks, I think, tomorrow, and um, it's been a wonderful visit. So what have I been doing and how have I been doing it? So this is my, this is my takeaway message. You should forget everything else I've said today. Remember this, because this is the, uh, the mantra you need when writing unit tests. You need to arrange, act, assert, and then optionally clean up. Um, so what do I mean by this? So every time that you are testing software, you're writing a unit test, these are the steps you need to go through. The first one is arrange. So you need to set up any data, parameters, any text context. Uh, then you need to, to act. You have to actually run the code that you are hoping to test. Uh, and then after that, you have to make sure that whatever it was doing, it actually did it. So that's where you make an assertion. Uh, and you make sure that the things you expected to happen actually did happen. And then optionally, if you need to, um, close any database connections, close any files, and remove any unwanted uh, system state. Now, it turns out when you actually go and do this on, on real, real code, real applications, you end up spending 95% of your time doing this first step, just arranging things. Um, and that's really where I've been spending most of my time on this project, is uh, easing the burden on having to arrange things um, to set up unit tests. So what does this actually look like uh, in practice? I know you're all really excited for good Python code. Uh, here's a test that I wrote for um, MetDB load. Uh, it's a test called uh, test met DB table counts. It basically runs some code that loads data into a database and then checks that the right number of things were loaded into that database. So how do we apply our AAA, our arrange, act, and assert pattern to this test? Well, I'll, I'll start from the bottom and work backwards. So the first thing is our assert. So we've got two lines down the bottom that do the assertion. Uh, they're basically saying for a table, how many, how many items do I expect in this table? Go and count them, that's fine, that's two lines. My act is even less. I'm just calling the load main function, um, which loads the data in, um, which means that there, everything else in this test is arrangements. But it's not as simple as that, because you see that this test also takes uh, six arguments, empty DB, test run SQL, temp path, met data, blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, and these things actually point to other bits of code uh, around which, if you add them all together, turn out to be about 200 lines of code for this test. So I think I said 95% of your time, if you do the math there, I think that's, in terms of code, lines written, 98.5%. Um, so I was pretty close. So what are all these other things? What are they doing and where do they come from and why do we need them? Um, so for the most part, they are bits of code we need to set up the, yeah, set up the, the, the system and set up the state of the program before we can execute that code. So Something like MetPlus is quite a complicated bit of code, and very rarely can you just execute a function and expect it to work without all of the context that sits above it and all the stack that it's expecting to be there before it gets executed. So these extra bits and pieces, um, so on the top there we've got something called test fixtures, on the bottom we've got some parameterizations. Um, but today I'm just gonna talk you through two things that I've been working quite a bit on, which are really important and really useful for testing. The first one's test fixtures, and the second one is mocking. So what is a test fixture? Uh, this is from the PyTest documentation. It's a software test fixtures, initialized test functions. They provide a fixed baseline. That's where the fixture comes from. A fixed baseline so that tests execute reliably and produce consistent, repeatable results, which is a very good thing. Uh, so some examples of test fixtures that I've been adding. Um, a test fixture might do something like create a YAML input file with specific test data. So both uh, MetBlotPy and MetCalcPy use YAML files as uh, config files. Um, so you can create a function that basically produces one that's appropriate for the test you're about to run. Uh, another thing is, you know, a, a very common thing is provide a temporary directory to write files to and then delete them afterwards so you don't want random files turning up. Uh, we can create a netcdf file with specific values inside it in a temporary location and yeah, again delete it after we're done. Or create a connection to a database and that's an example from that 
previous bit of code I showed you, we had empty DB, which is basically creating an empty database, which we could then operate on and make sure that we didn't have any extraneous data in there. And again, here's just uh, an example of a test fixture that is in matplotpy. Uh, here at the top, the top kind of two thirds of this is using X-Array to create um, a data set which has some values, some latitudes, some longitudes, some times. And then down at the bottom you can see we've got the uh, at PyTest fixture to indicate this is a fixture. And then we're just creating a NetCDF file from this data um, and making that available for the tests. Now, the big advantage of doing it this way as opposed to the naive way, the naive way is to basically create that NetCDF file and commit it to your repository as a, as a you know, binary file is that here, if I wanted to you know, have different latitudes or different longitudes, it's very easy for me to inject these into my data set there, then create the fixture. And I can do, you know, I can extend this to do that kind of on the fly as well. So test fixtures, very, very useful things. <clears throat> the second thing that I've um, been introducing to the data set, to the, to the test suites, is a thing called mocks. Uh, and our mocking is actually part of the uh, Python standard library now. I think they introduced it in 3.6 or 3.8, somewhere around there. Uh, so this is directly from the Python documentation. Um, mocking allows you to replace part of your system under test with mock objects and make assertions about how they have been used. So we're replacing things with other things using mocks. Now, I'm just going to use a fictitious example here. <clears throat> this is not an example from the work I've been doing, but hopefully I'll just illustrate the idea. So suppose we have some function. It's called create file name. It uh, just returns some file name with a date stamp inserted into it. So this is very simple, very common kind of thing you might do. Um, but the issue here is that it's going to call some other function called date today, which returns uh, some string representation of the date with hours, minutes, seconds attached to it. So pretty simple, nothing too scary, right? But how do we apply our arrange, act, and assert pattern here? So arrangement turns out to be very, very easy. This is uh, the create file name, takes no arguments and has no context, so we don't need to arrange anything. Um, acting is very easy. We, just, we can just call create file name again. It takes no arguments, so that's very easy to do. <clears throat> the problem comes when we want to assert. Because every time we call create file name, it's going to return a string that's reliant on the time that it was called. So if we're going to have some kind of assert here, it's going to be different every single time we run this test. If we run it at midnight, it's different from when we run it at 12 o'clock. Uh, so it actually becomes quite a difficult problem. And this is usually where most software developers go, ah, oh, I don't need to test this, it's simple, whatever. I'll just move on with my life. And they, of course, would be wrong uh, because if you're writing source code, you have to write tests as well. Every, everyone agrees with me, right? Yep, everyone's nodding. So the way we, the, well, one of the ways that we can get around with this is we can do a thing called mocking. So remember, mocking is about replacing parts of your system with other things. And in this case, uh, we're going to replace that date today with mock date today. And I'm, I'm brushing over a lot of the information, implementation details here, but this just gives you the gist of what we're doing. And instead of returning the time um, right now, I'm just returning a representation of the time at a specific date. Uh, and the cool thing about this is you can choose you know, fun dates, like the 29th of February. 2100. Now, because we're returning a, a set date every time when we call mock date today, we can then go ahead and actually do our asserts. Uh, and just to kind of complete the example, here's how your, your test code might look. Um, so the way that you apply that mock is you use this thing called patch. So with patch, we're replacing date today with mock date today. Then we act, we call that code, and then after that we assert. And one of the other cool features about using mocks is they have these extra kind of functionality around them. So here are, we're also asserting that mock date today was called exactly once. And while that might be trivial in this instance, you can think of an example where uh, suppose create file name was calling tens or hundreds of other functions, which is, is quite common. Um, you might want to check that something is only called once or that it's called twice or that it's called with a specific set of arguments. So mocks are a really, really useful tool for testing. All right. Enough, enough nerding out about that. Um, how's the project actually going and what have I done in the last five weeks? Uh, so here's just a couple of, couple of highlights. Um, one of the, the first things we're working on is improving uh, the tool configuration and how they're installed. Uh, and sort of the outcome of that is we've got better control on 
what we're testing when we run tests, what we're including in our coverage reports, uh, making sure that that's kind of a sensible set of the, the actual source code that's going to be executed, not, not extra things. Um, in terms of the actual uh, repositories, I've, I've mostly been working on uh, metdata.io and, and particularly metdbload, metplotpy, and metcalcpy. Uh, some of the really nice things that I have managed to deliver is you know, implementing test database and testing infrastructure for metdbload. Um, this has basically allowed us to run the tests in, in GitHub Actions, so they weren't really running for, for metdb load at all. Um, so that's why I've said it's increased from 0% to 81%. Uh, so that's a really nice result. Uh, for metplotpy, implementing fixtures uh, for data creation and um, plot comparisons. We all, we all know what fixtures are now, so that's great. Um, and in particular, you know, providing some examples of how we would compare the plots produced by Plotly. So Plotly is one of the plotting libraries used. Um, and how we would compare these uh, by their JSON representation. So before this, we were basically writing images to disk as, as JPEGs and comparing them to other JPEGs that we had already, and that's kind of fraught with um, OS-specific issues around how those things are rendered and compared. Uh, so this is just a nice kind of bit more robust way of comparing the plot outputs are the same. And lastly, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time in MetCalcPy, but have managed to kind of write a few tests and lift the, lift the test coverage um, from 25 up to 40%. Uh, but the project's not over by any sense. My visit here is going to finish up tomorrow, but um, this project will continue for several months still. Um, talking to the team, I've kind of come up with 21 project milestones, uh, but I'll have to continue to work on them from back home in Australia. And you'll have to see what they are in my final report when I deliver it in probably six months' time. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? So given you've been here in person, how much has that helped your productivity of being here to interact with the team itself? Um, a huge amount and not necessarily for the reasons you might think. I mean, it's been great having a particular minnow right next door who's been uh, very quick on the reviews and being able to answer questions. Um, being in the same time zone actually helps quite a lot. Uh, so I, I mentioned at the top that I did some work from Australia um, last year, and that was very much, you would do a day's work, you'd submit a review, and everyone would be asleep, so you'd wait, and then I'd be asleep, and then I'd get up, and there was about an hour or two where we were both in the office at the same time that you might be able to, to quickly ask George a question or something. Uh, so that's certainly been a huge help for productivity. Um, then there's been kind of the, 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 the less kind of direct things that have been great, so sitting in, in on the meetings, so I've been trying to go to as many plus meetings as I can. Um, not necessarily to contribute, but just to see how the team works, what are the pain points, what, how do they interact with, you know, a great example is how they interact with the, um, the GitHub discussions. So they kind of, they, every week they bring it up saying, look, we, we're working on this, we're working, someone's raised an issue about this, what are we going to do about that? Um, and it's been good to see that some of those questions have been from Bureau staff who have kind of been, you know, hey, I think this is an issue, and these guys are saying, who is this person? Um, <laughs> so that's been a really nice... Thing as well, but I think that the number one thing that's really made this as productive as it could be is being away from my home organization, <laughs> being away, you know, having my out of office on, just being like, I'm actually working on this project all the time, not in between the meetings. Uh, so that's that's you know, these guys have been saying, Oh, John, you've been so productive, and I've said, I've never had so much time to just concentrate on the one thing. <laughs> in, you know, it's been over a decade since I've had that kind of kind of luxury, so it's, it has been really, really important to be here in person. It's been great. Good. All right. I mean, we can call it a day. Happy to. I'm wondering how we can take the what you've contributed and move it forward. Uh, you know, continue down the path. Um, 
do you think there's anything, uh, I guess, have you added anything to the, or the existing documentation in Read the Docs about the testing, like the, in the contributor's yeah, guide perhaps, good. perhaps? Great question. So I mentioned there was those 21 milestones. One of them was update the documentation, which I haven't done yet, but I, I, I do plan to. Okay. Um, I, I guess, you know, in, in, in a more kind of like direct sense, um, please look at the pull requests that I've put in. If you, if you are dabbling in the tests, have a look at some of the tests that I've written there and see, see how they've been structured. And um, certainly with those ideas about fixtures and mocks, those are things that you should be able to reuse um, again and again. So if you're doing something that looks similar to something that's already there, uh, you go, oh, how, you know, what's been implemented? Can I use that again in my own test? Yeah, uh, well, I will mention that it, it's been really helpful seeing examples of things you've done before. I'm like, oh, I should have done it this way. Or yep. I didn't know about it. So it's been helpful just at least seeing the examples. Thanks, John. Thank you. Appreciate it.